Samita Jain. I'm CEO of Readability, and I have a very special guest with me today, Dr. Mimi Narti. Hi, Mimi. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Oh, it's such a pleasure, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your full schedule to be with us. And speaking of full schedules, why don't you let our viewers know a little bit about yourself? I'll go ahead and let you do that. All right. Well, I am a work at home mom, work from home mom. I've got two kids. I have a son who's in third grade and I have a daughter who's in seventh grade. Um, and what's really interesting in our family is about two years ago. So right before uh, middle school, we decided to pull my daughter out of traditional school and do a homeschool hybrid program. And so I, you know, talked it over with my husband and with my daughter and we decided to make this kind of lifestyle commitment because that's really what it is um, to taking a non-traditional educational path. And then of course now um, because of the context of COVID, my son is also at home distance learning. So I kind of even got more than I bargained for. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Well, it's commendable um, that you're taking this on and I, and also the, courage, right? I think every parent has experienced that this year or in 2020, this whole time during COVID, what it's like to have to try and do everything that you're responsible for and now have to be responsible for your child's learning. And speaking with a lot of parents, they do feel like there's been um, a lack of learning. Um, and I thought that maybe as a, a mom who has taken this on, who was doing it, you know, and then taking on a much more greater, I, I don't want to say burden because teaching our kids is a joy and a gift, um, but taking this extra, you know, responsibility, responsibility. on, yeah. yes. What has that like been, uh, what has that been like for you? Um, so it has required a lot of like flexibility of mind, adaptability, um, what I would say is in some ways, it's interesting because I made this decision just ahead of the pandemic. So I was prepared in ways that, you know, other women that I know, other mothers weren't exactly. Mm -hmm. We had had someone come in and do kind of a consultation to help us organize like a homeschool classroom. And we had taken all of these steps. So it was really serendipitous, um, that it was kind of the, you know, I was able to make the most out of the situation. I felt a, like I had a little bit of infrastructure or framework to, to have this happen uh, in our lives. But definitely, you know, even making that initial decision was a challenge. Now, uh, prior to this, uh, for nearly a decade, I was a college professor. I taught classes in environmental science and public health at the university level. So one would think that I would have a lot of confidence in taking on, you know, like a middle school uh, teaching, but it really, um, it really is something that, you know, you have to just uh, give yourself a lot of grace. You commit to the process. I think it's really great to kind of set deliverables for yourself. So you feel like you are hitting certain things because there's so mm -hmm. much flux and flow. It really is, um, you know, it grows you in the way of learning to be just very flexible and adaptable. So that sounds like great advice to all those parents out there that have been learning this this past year is to just breathe and um, be flexible. But I, I know that there, you know, speaking to parents out there, there's a little bit of that stress that are my kids learning? Are they absorbing this material? You know, have we wasted a year? So what do you think about that? Is that something that you're seeing yourself? I would say, um, you know, every child's different and every, you know, familial circumstance is different. And so I've even seen, you know, disparate outcomes between my two kids because I have one who's a little bit older and a bit more autonomous. And in some ways, you know, she has gained and thrived a bit, but my younger son, it is a challenge. And so I think for me, there's just been a reframe. Right mm -hmm. now, the best I can do is just support him emotionally uh, through this. And then what I will look to do is as things open back up, as we get back into a normal rhythm, really kind of concentrate on assessing then the learning gaps. And when we have that kind of stability and that security back, then that's the opportunity to kind of go back through and say, okay, well, maybe we didn't make as much progress here or here as we'd like. But at the end of the day, we survived a pandemic. <laughs> we, we, we learned and we grew in many ways. And I see my children, you know, being forced to mature in ways that I might not have pushed them to. 
So like I said, it's really about the framework. And then there are strategies always to close the learning gaps. First, first thing first is to, you know, work, work on and support the, um, the mental and emotional health of the children. And that's what I think we really should focus our attention on. And that's where we can also find some grace in our own process. Like, no, this isn't going to be necessarily the year where you get five reading levels ahead or something mm-hmm. like that. But what have we learned about ourselves? What have we learned about ourselves as individuals and as a family? And in the coming year, we'll go back through and see, you know, where we can get additional support for the learning process. I love that. I love that so much. I love the idea of focusing on their mental and emotional well-being, their health there, as we see so much happening in our in society and with our kids, um, being there for them on an emotional um, level really speaks to me. And I'm sure it speaks to our viewers as well. Um, because, you know, parents have gone through their own stuff too. And so they're, yes. they're really struggling. They're really, you know, out there struggling, whether it's you know, trying to work and teach their kids and um, financially. I mean, there's just been such an impact on so many families out there. And do you, what would you suggest we do, or do you have any ideas um, yourself on how we can bridge that gap in learning? Um, I know that you have to assess where your child may be falling behind, whether it's English, math, science, um, but what would, what would you suggest we do to, you know, to help understand where they're falling behind and what can we do to help them? I think, uh, again, in the coming months and over the next, uh, you know, year or so, I'm going to really suggest that all parents get in really close communication with the, with the instructor. So if you aren't the instructor yourself, um, again, I have the one child who will go back to traditional school um, mm-hmm. and really keep those open lines of communication and ask for those kinds of assessments and, and, um, and that feedback on where, you know, things may have fallen short. Uh, for me as a homeschooling mom, um, I get to, because I determine the curriculum, I kind of can see where we are. And I would say more of the, um, the challenge there is, you know, maybe I had intended for us to finish this curriculum by this time and we haven't done that, but, All of it, again, like I said, it's a reframe and just understanding that, you know, it seems like it's been a a long time and it seems like the impact is, you know, more immense than it actually is. A year, even if, you know, you had to pull the child out of school for a year, people have to leave school for health reasons for a year, for other, there are many reasons why this could have happened. Um, and people are able to find some sort of resilience in a moment like this. So again, it's just about changing what the expectations are in mind um, to say that, you know, it didn't, it doesn't have to be the way that I had originally imagined it. Obviously, it's not going to be the way that I had originally imagined it. But, you know, sometimes children, you might say the child needs to repeat. That's okay. That's okay. It's one that year. Okay. Exactly. That's okay. okay. One year in the life of, uh, in your whole life is not going to make or break you. Yeah. And I think, like I said, that's what I mean about having the flexibility of mind and really just seeing that there's more time in this process than we think that we have set an arbitrary, in many ways, an almost an arbitrary amount of time for an elementary education or for, you know, the K through 12 it's, it's a little bit subjective what, what those years are going to be. And because um, I have one parent who's from another country, you have like different, I have different worldviews that I borrow from. So, you know, here we have a certain age that kids start school. What's so funny is um, in my dad's country, uh, Ghana, he would tell me that when a child can kind of put their hand over their head and touch their ear, that's when they say you're ready for school. So, you know, it's just kind of funny. So it doesn't, it's not really age dependent. So when you kind of, again, borrow from other people's perspectives and see that there's more flexibility in this, there's more than one way to skin a cat, the timeframes that we put, the pressures associated with those timeframes that we put on ourselves are really more imagined than real. Then it gives us the breathing room to be creative about what we can do to, to rise to this challenge. 
I love that, Mimi. And I'm sure the teachers that are watching us today are saying, yes, Mimi. And the parents that are watching are just so thankful for that hope and uh, peace of mind that you're giving them that it's going to be okay, because that's exactly what you're saying, that it's going to be okay. And to, um, and to make sure that you're watching their emotional and mental uh, health and well-being. Right. And I would even push it further. You know, I'm a I always say my superpower is ruthless optimism. I think that from this, we have, um, as a society, and especially with our kids, access technology in a way where after this, in the aftermath of this, if we're very creative, we can apply um, some of that um, technological um, intellect that, that we've gained to really improve access to education and really improve opportunities for kids like through readability and, and other kinds of things because the kids now have such an appetite and the skill, a new level of skill to navigate these things. Um, and the technology can be, um, you know, can lead to more equitable outcomes eventually. So I'm hoping that will be in the long term how we gain. And, you know, you bring up a really good point. There are studies out there um, that do talk about how technology, you know, things like um, when AI is speaking to you, kids are very receptive to it. And so yeah. this is a, a mechanism, a, a way in which you can supplement their education. So you, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. Um, so Mimi, I, I feel like you've given us... And by the way, folks, for all of you today watching, Mimi is so humble and just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a mom and I homeschool. She's <laughs> also a coach. She, um, there's so much that she's doing um, out there with Mimi. I think you should tell them because I would love to hear a little bit more about the other things that you're doing and, and how, you know, I, you're just amazing. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I feel like... Um... I'm very, very passionate about education, and I conceive education very broadly, what that looks like and what that means. And so I do coach soccer. In a past life, I was a professional soccer player, and I did get the chance to compete in the Women's World Cup. Um, Amazing. You know, it's like secret lives of moms, you know, you kind of <laughs> secret lives of moms. Yeah, you're um, just not a mom, even though yeah. it's amazing, yes. Um, so I do coach, uh, youth soccer. I do spend a, a big part of my time invested in that because I also can see that as a different kind of educational intervention. I think sports is one epistemology, one way of knowing things. And I like to support kids learning and development through that. Um, another project that I've been working on for about five years is called race, class, and parenting. And it's really a social justice parenting intervention. So um, I host symposiums, I create content, I write books, all related to social justice parenting. I think a lot of people, especially during the same time, it seems to have overlapped uh, much with COVID. There's been so much um, social and political unrest. And I know that there are a lot of people who are looking for support, um, you know, through their parenting process with that, how to open up conversations with kids about social injustice, how to give them a more tolerant and inclusive worldview. And so I have a passion to help those parents, what I always say is parent to their intentions uh, by providing them information and support. I love that parent to their intentions. And where can uh, parents watching today and teachers watching today find you? Where, where can okay. they find this class? Yes, so um, I have a YouTube channel call, called Mom Peditor by Mimi Narte, like competitor, Mom Peditor. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have, you know, a lot of content there if you just wanted to, for example, see a video about what is systemic racism. I have a couple of uh, ebooks on available on Amazon.com um, under the title Race, Class, and Parenting, or you can search my name, Mimi Narte. Or you could just, you know, reach out to me directly at drmiminarte at gmail.com. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mimi. That's amazing. And I really enjoyed talking to you today. And as you can see, audience, she's she's not just a homeschooling mom. She's so many <laughs> things to so many people. And um, I just really enjoyed our talk today. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thanks so much, Amita. You're a person for whom I also have a great amount of respect. So I'm excited to be here.
Thank you. Well, I think, feel like we're going to do great things together, you know, and it's all about our kids. It's uplifting our children, the most vulnerable in our society. And um, so we have a common path there and a common goal, uh, you know, when it comes to our kids. Thank you. Thanks.